Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our uh, ICD section 15 uh, monthly, uh, bi monthly webinar. And uh, we'll be starting our webinar shortly at about 9 30, okay, about two minutes' time. And um, we're just waiting a few more to join us. And uh, our speaker, Dr. Benny uh, Sugiharto from University of Indonesia, is also uh, has joined us. We just give about one or two minutes more uh, before we will um, start our webinar tonight. And our webinar is also available on YouTube. Okay. And uh, I shortly I will give you uh, the link of our YouTube link uh, so that um, you can share um, with our, your friends uh, who want to join us uh, tonight. So this is the YouTube link. You can pass around to your colleagues uh, who want to join us via YouTube. Okay, and uh, tonight we got about um, hundred uh, participants who has registered uh, to listen to Dr. Benny, and of course uh, we have um, uh, participants coming as far from India, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and uh, Myanmar, a part of our uh, region in Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. Uh, Brunei and Cambodia, uh, who have joined, also Philippines, uh, who have joined us tonight. So um, give us about another minute or so. Uh, well, as I will start introducing our speaker uh, at uh, 9.30 on the dot of Malaysian time. Okay, uh, Dr. Benny, you ready? Ready, Professor Ibrahim. Good evening, selamat malam. Yeah, malam. So very nice batik you have there. <laughs> Terima kasih. <laughs> What is behind? What, what mountain is it behind you? Uh, that actually the picture I took when I was uh, having a holiday in Bali. That's uh, oh. the picture of a uh, Mount Bato, which is north uh, in the middle of the uh, Bali. Okay, all right. Uh, maybe cool. once once the pandemic is over, now we will we shall be inviting you to come to Indonesia. Okay, okay. Uh, for my part, some time I have not been to Bali. Okay, with me tonight, assisting me in uh, doing this webinar is. Uh, uh, Dr. Amy Amelia, she's from Indonesia also. Uh, huh. right. And of course, um, uh, Associate Professor Datin, Dr. Mayuna. So uh, these are my two strong ladies helping uh, to conduct this webinar. Um, Good evening, Dr. Since one and a half years ago, <laughs> since we started one and a half years ago. Right, Amy, uh, ready? So yes, okay, uh, 9.30 now. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, he is Dr. Sugi, um, Benny Sugiharto. Dr. Benny obtained his dental degree from University of Indonesia, Jakarta. Further on, he took his orthodontic training at the Eastman Dental Institute at Hospital and Hospital College, UCL, London, and complete with the company of MSc in Odontics and also MO from Royal College of Surgeons, um, England. He then took up a research on graduate post and obtained his PhD degree from the same institute. Upon his return to Jakarta, he underwent a specialist adaptation program at the University of Indonesia to obtain his local recognition as specialist in orthodontics, uh, Indonesian uh, version. Yeah. He now holds senior lecturers, post and consultant at the Department of Orthodontic Faculty of Dentistry, University of Indonesia. He is an active member of Board of Committee of Indonesian Association of Orthodontists, IAO, and sits on the Indonesian College Board of Orthodontists. He maintains his private practice at Auto Smile Dental Care Club for Garden, uh, Jakarta, and a rumor sakit Pondok Indah at Puri Indah Hospital, Jakarta. Uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Benny uh, will talk about uh, early orthodontic treatment, myths, and facts. Dr. Benny? Uh, this stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Prof. Ibrahim. Let me just uh, set my screen first. Give me a second. I believe you can uh, see my slides well, Prof. And hear my voice well? Yeah, clearly. Clearly, yeah? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Ibrahim 
for giving me the opportunity to speak and share uh, at the prestigious International College of Dentists Section 15 tonight. Uh, this is my honor. Uh, I was also approached by uh, Professor Ita, uh, who is now a professor already, uh, Prabhu Ibrahim. Uh, he talked to me whether I would like to also share this, uh, uh, this presentation with the ICD forum. But before we start the talk, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone. And I hope everyone is in the good health, even though we are still in the midst of this COVID pandemic. But again, even though we are still in the midst of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, we all have this uh, restriction of movement, but that doesn't actually inhibit us of meeting. And now the world has converted that far that now we can uh, have new platforms of uh, getting in touch and sharing knowledge uh, via virtual meetings. So uh, I hope one day uh, soon the pandemic will end. And as Prof. Ibrahim said, maybe he wants to visit Bali. He hasn't been visiting Bali. So hopefully, uh, especially the region can open up again and then we can travel and meet all our friends uh, from the region. So my name is Dr. Benny. Uh, you could just call me Benny. Uh, I teach at the University of Indonesia. So we normally just call it University of Indonesia. Uh, this is my main campus at the outskirts, in the southern part of the outskirts of Jakarta. This is the main campus uh, in the area called Depok. Uh, in the Depok campus now, uh, it lies all the uh, new uh, built university hospital, as well as the health sciences campus. Uh, where actually it houses the Faculty of Medicine and the Faculty of Dentistry. But it's now still mainly used uh, for the teaching of the undergraduate uh, students. The new campus of the dental faculty ha now has uh, better facilities. It has now new dental simulation facilities as well. Whilst uh, most of the postgraduates and the clinical work is done on the Salemba campus, which is at the central of Jakarta, uh, where now it houses the newly refurbished and renovated uh, dental hospital. This is how the new dental hospital look like. But then again, because of the pandemic, uh, right now we have to adapt the way we work and we have to look like that with all the PPEs, for those who are my residents. And every time we, use, we do the aerosol protocol, uh, the aerosol, uh, aerosol density procedures, we have to use the, also the high uh, vacuum evacuator as well nearby. But then again, that's how we adapt with this new situation. Despite of all the academic work, uh, the other thing that I enjoy by doing teaching is that I can mingle with all my residents. Uh, annually, we do the community service and social gatherings. This was the the year last before the pandemic occurred, uh, we all went to the Komodo Island. Komodo Island is where the old dragon lizard uh, resides, which is near the it's about, uh, several minutes flight from Bali. And despite that, by doing some teaching as well, I also involved myself in the regional uh, orthodontic meeting and organization, such as the Asia Pacific Orthodontic Society. And it is always good to see friends from the region as well, uh, share knowledge and maintain good friendship, especially in the midst of this pandemic. Having friends everywhere is always helpful uh, because we can always share uh, how the pandemic happens in other countries and we can adapt to so One of the meetings that we had in 2018, we, had, we hosted the World Implant Orthodontic Conference in Bali. Uh, you can see the top picture shows me and my colleagues uh, as a committee member uh, relaxing after the meeting finish. And of course, the bottom picture shows when we were having the Galadina by the beach. So I think we all do miss all our events like this. So hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, the pandemic will end soon and the border is open. Uh, before I start to the core of the talk, uh, I would like to distract all of you because we are doing the seminar in the evening. So I hope we are not all falling asleep. We have a picture of Prince William, which is the Duke of Cambridge now. 
And uh, at that time, there was once a picture where it was called controversial, where Prince William was uh, shot with a picture like that. And it went viral on the social media. And then, oh my God, what was the prince doing by posturing the finger like that? And it was controversial. But again, it's, the picture shows uh, the importance of having perspective in seeing news or seeing an event. We have to cover from all sides as much as possible so we are not losing the bigger context. Because, in fact, when we look from a different perspective, it shows a completely different story and may not be controversial at all. So I put the title as the importance of perspective. And that includes in orthodontics as well, which is for me, it looks like a complicated, huge puzzle because there's just a lot of things to consider. We don't just do clinical stuff, but we also want to appraise uh, literature as well, uh, the evidence as well. And these are the things that we want to go through uh, some of the stuff that uh, are to be done normally in the clinic, mainly for kids, which is the early treatment. What is actually the early treatment? Well, the early treatment is any treatment procedures which eliminate or reduce the severity of a developing malocclusion, uh, making future treatment simpler, cost-effective, and efficient, be it dental or skeletal problems. The early treatment mostly done during the extension stage, typically around under 10 years old of a chronological age. This treatment, sometimes some of them may require growth assessment before starting. The aims of this early treatment, obviously, is to minimize the extent of developing malocclusion. For example, minimize crowding, eliminating displacement, or even simplifying skeletal problems. It also aims to prevent uh, trauma to upper incisors and also boosting up psychosocial development. Of course, we need to routinely screening our patients, and preferably all kids uh, about at eight uh, age eight to 10 years old to be evaluated by an orthodontist. We need to check unusual things, uh, unusual developments uh, clinically. And we normally do take OPG for the screening and probably other x-rays when necessary because we have to remember still the ALARA principle. So the early treatment uh, covers a lot and a wide range of uh, uh, situations, but uh, at this evening, because I, I couldn't uh, cover everything, but I would just do point on certain issues where it might be interesting to share and to listen to. First is about the oral bad habits, uh, which includes the detecting habits, tongue trusting, and also lip biting. Then the correction of dental, uh, anterior and posterior cross-bite, uh, normally with uh, displacement. And the main part of the talk will be talking about the correction of a class two and class three skeletal discrepancies, which is, uh, until now, it's still mainly controversial as well. So the all of the habits, uh, what we're talking, what we're going to talk tonight is about digit sucking habits, some trusting, and the biting. It's very simple stuff. We uh, normally see these cases, and obviously at general dentist as well, uh, you all need to uh, be able to uh, undertake these kind of cases. The all of that habit. When it's uh, occurring and giving a manifestation as a malocclusion, it has to meet three criteria where it has the intensity, the frequency, and the duration. Or we normally call it as the oral bad habit triad. Without the combination of these three, a malocclusion will not develop because of the, uh, of the bad habit. So the effect of the digit sucking habits is to alter the pressures of soft tissue and just distorting the equilibrium. If you look at the picture on the bottom left, it was actually the, the equilibrium theory that was actually determined by Profit, Professor Profit in the University of North Carolina. And it says that the tooth position is determined by the soft tissue balance, by the pressures of the lips and the pressures of the tongues. This by performing a digit sucking, the habit actually breaks that balance, that equilibrium uh, area. And if this is meeting the 
all of them have a triad, then a malnutrition would occur. That's typically uh, how a thumb and digit sucking habit would actually be done by a kid. And it would uh, create an intro effects by having propline upper incisors. Uh, typically also we'll have uh, retropane lower incisors, uh, also muscular axe constrictions, cross bites, and also enter open bite. Again, another diagrammatic of the positions. And the narrow of the maxillary arcs can also uh, happen because if you look at the top left picture, the position of the thumb presses the thumb downwards. And thus, the, the pressure from the cheek would not allow the expansion of that maxilla occurring naturally. That's why people will have uh, who, who performs uh, digit sucking habit would normally have a narrower maxilla. And then what? Well, uh, the first thing that we can do is by having psychological counseling. We, we try to communicate this with the parents and also, also with the kid. The other thing that could be done is uh, performing an aversive taste treatment. I mean, when I was young, I remember I, do, I did these things as well. Uh, I don't know whether I... I hope now we don't have to do it this way again, but uh, my mom used to put a sambal or a chili around my finger to stop me doing that. Uh, or you can put uh, a band-aid around it to, as a reminder. Then again, all the other persuasive uh, method fail, then perhaps a fixed habit taker appliance uh, could be considered, uh, which actually also found uh, to be uh, working as well, if all the other methods are not uh, actually uh, working well. What about the tongue trusting? Tongue trusting, you have the primary and you have the secondary or the adaptive one. The primary is very rare. It only affects uh, less than 1% of the population. So we're not gonna talk about that. Mainly um, uh, it's causing uh, an open bite, but again, it's very difficult to manage. and. Uh, occasionally associated also with uh, lack of neuromuscular control and also some syndromes as well. But what I'm trying to talk about is about secondary tongue trusting, which is occurring uh, as an attempt to achieve an oral seal, anterior oral seal when the lips are incompetent. Uh, normally, an anterior open bite is already present. Uh, normally, it's a secondary to uh, uh, already happening a digit sucking habit. Then the trust may maintain their enter open bite, or it may adapt if the AOB is corrected. It may also be in a data form due to severe high angle because of a skeletal enter open bite, such as probably people who uh, suffer from mouth breathing because of an upper airway obstruction. So the picture here shows the incorrect uh, swallowing on the left hand side where the sun passes forward against the teeth. The, the right one shows the correct one, where the tongue was actually not pressing onto the teeth surface when uh, the person is performing a deglutition process. So the sucking of digits will create an AOB and normally with an increase over depth. And secondary to the habit, uh, there will be a tongue thrusting to create an anterior seal. And therefore, the tongue trust is associated with the habit itself. Now, if, that, if, we, if we can stop the habit before nine years old, normally a uh, natural reduction of the AOB can change, can happen. But if the habit remains beyond the age of nine, uh, the tongue trust becomes an inbred, even if the digit sucking stops. And therefore, we may have to intervene by orthodontic means. This is a typical picture of the existing tongue trusting habit. Then the last one is about lip biting. Well, the lip biting normally occurs as a secondary to the existing uh, propination of the upper labor segments. And maybe also due to another habit or underlying skeletal problem, uh, especially in class two division one. And the lower lip is also mostly beaten to achieve anterior seal. But also sometimes I found uh, in my patients, uh, it shows also some psychological uh, incompetences of our patient feels uh, inconfident. They like to bite their lower lip. And it, 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 it is very common to see this uh, lower lip biting habit 
uh, in chips. This is uh, one of the typical cases that are treated with a uh, lower lip biting habit, but also having a pre existing across the division one uh, skeletal wave. And that's the mechanism how the lip biting habit can propine the upper incisors because the lip will push the upper labor segment forward. And you can see in the previous picture, the proclination is symmetrical between the upper left central and the lateral, and also the upper right central and the lateral as well. And then one, well, uh, for this case, we really want to do an interceptive open treatment. We need to correct the upper labor segment proclination. Uh, well, we may want to consider a growth modification if necessary, if there's an underlying the problem. And we wanted to, at the end, to position the lower lip at the at least one third size of, of the upper labial segment to achieve stability. And that's what we did to that patient. Uh, we did it with the twin block at that time to uh, correct the underlying skeletal problem, and it helps retroclining the upper labial segments and helping achieving a good profile. Just the patient actually feel much more confident following the treatment. What about crotchet of dental crossbites? We see what we call as the pseudoclastes in anterior dental crossbite with displacements, or sometimes also posterior dental crossbites with displacement. It can be with one tooth or several tooth in the buccal segment that can be involved. For example, the anterior dental crossbite with displacement are shown in this case where it may cause tooth wear in the lower incisors and also appear damage with a loss of attachment. You can see on the uh, top right picture, on the lower left central shows there's a, a loss of attachment. And there's a picture of a single crossbite uh, in the lower. We may want to approach this kind of case with a, a simple URA or the upper removal appliance with posterior bite laser or a two by four uh, fixed appliances. But I always prefer to use a removable appliance because uh, I don't really like to use a, a fixed braces during early stages, it just pose a uh, risk for caries when we pose the patient to uh, certain commitments, especially with cleaning. And that's just an example of a case of a single cross bite treated with a simple dark spring and a posterior bite racer. And it was just done in the patient with using it very well. And within just merely just five months, the uh, patient was very happy. So it still worked by using the uh, upper in blue appliance. What about the posterior dental crossbite with displacement? That's an example of uh, a, a unilateral posterior crossbite. And if it's not treated early, it may be established. It will be harder to correct uh, when the occlusion uh, is stabilized. In this kind of cases, we want to expand the macular arts, correct the crossbites, and eliminate the displacement. We may want to consider also a URA upper removal appliance with expansion screws or a quad helix where we can do a differential uh, side of expansion. Then now comes uh, the main part of this talk, which is about the uh, skeletal discrepancies. We are now seeing these are uh, uh, mainly what we know as the class two and the class three skeletal discrepancies with uh, the underlying uh, skeletal structures. We normally see the people by looking at the profiles But then again, if we look differently at the different components, we see actually for each malocclusion have different variations. For example, like for the dental one, we can see that the prognatic maxilla, the blue one represents the uh, maxillary base, whilst the light blue one consider the alveolar uh, maxilla, which, which is malleable. So we have the dental and skeletal uh, plaster malocclusions with their variations as well as what we know of the class three malocclusion, as well, again, with the uh, variations of the components. When we are approaching this kind of problems, obviously, one may ask like a chicken and egg quest, which one is first? Which one uh, involved well, genetic or environment or a combination of both? Or we call that as the epigenetic factors. Now to answer that, sometimes we want to come into this kind of anecdote. We are, uh, I'm just wondering whether everybody is familiar with this picture. So in the ancient times, we know that uh, 
women at that time have their feet binded backward like that. At that ancient time, it was considered to be something quite uh, appealing. Perhaps if we can, I can use this word, now we can, we can call it uh, something sexy or something, uh, something which is adorable by the opposing uh, sex. I'm not sure why. Probably now, if I see it from nowadays world, I would see probably so uh, the woman will not uh, go to the shopping mall and spend with credit cards probably, so they can't go anywhere too far from home. But what's the interesting part with this picture is that we open up that shoes, we can see that the form of the feet were like that. And this actually uh, intrigue an interesting uh, thought to some researchers to look further to see and ask the question whether we can actually modify, can we modify growth? Can we stop the growth? They even do some scanning as well. That's, I took it liberally from a journal. But in fact, some of the uh, experts believe that we can't actually create extra growth, but we're merely redirecting the growth. And that what causes the feet to be bent backward. The question is, how can the, the bone adapt to that position? Because they were treated early, they were, they, were, they, were, they were bounded like that early. And then can we do it to the, to the skeletal jaw with the same idea by intervening too early? Now, most of us were taught, especially those who underwent uh, special training, that we would like to always intervene when we want to modify growth at the time of puberty, where growth modification is still possible because once the growth era uh, ends, and then we may have to consider a camouflage treatment or surgical options. Now, to understand where the time of the puberty, for people who underwent training, they normally uh, come across with methods of determining the timing of that pubertal spurt. You can use hand with x-ray, cervical vertebral maturation, standing height, or sometimes uh, sexual maturation as well. Um, why do people need cervical maturation assessment? Well, because they consider chronological age, uh, it has a wide variation, and it doesn't actually show uh, maturations of the body. So, some of them consider the use of standing height because uh, it believe in the perceived the, the association between the growth of body height and the clinical dimensions. But again, the peak growth of the body height coincides with or is slightly before the peak of the mandibular growth. So it's not accurate. Why? Because when we have this sort of growth chart, we have to pin the patients in several measurements before we know which quartile actually the patient follows. So at that time, the consideration is that maybe once we know which quartile that the patient follows, we pass the, uh, the, the pubertal growth spot already. Then uh, it was also suggested the use of hands x-rays or carpal x-rays with different methods. And I'm sure you are all familiar with this. We have the Grafen-Brown uh, method, in, uh, was proposed in 1976, as well as uh, Fishman's filter maturation index in 1982, which was simpler. I had the privilege to know uh, Dr. Fishman personally when I actually attended his home in Skinny Atlas in the Upper State, New York. But then, then, but again, there's a lot of criticism or using the hand with x-rays because of the x-ray radiations. And as we remember, we have to always come up back to uh, the use of the ALARA principle. We want to be as low as minimum uh, as possible exposing a patient with radiations. So then comes uh, the idea of using a cervical vertebrae maturation, which is already included in our routine uh, cephalometric x-ray. It was initially 
proposed by Lampaski in 1972. And then it gained popularity. It was uh, researched well. And then a lot of the research followed and showed high correlation between the CVM, also with standing height, and also CVM is a filter maturation index. But then again, most of them use correlation that doesn't really show which one is better, CPM or uh, let's say the filter maturation index. And then there were uh, other research that showed already uh, in 2008 that actually SMI and CVM has uh, excellent uh, predictors for uh, predicting the peak height velocity with differences between 1% to 7%. Then in 2005, Bacchetti revised uh, the original six stage of the Lamparty uh, CVM by using only C2 to C64. Because nowadays, the polymetric x ray avoid uh, exposing until the C5 and C6. So we are interested about the CF3 and CF4. The question is now whether, after we know all these methods of uh, looking at the timing, whether is it necessary to be as accurate as that? So that's going to be what we are going to discuss after this. Then what? Timing of growth modification. We want to see it's still much, uh, very much in debate and controversy. And although many clinical decisions are based on the rate of craniofacial growth, we, are sti we still want to treat patient orthodontically during the period of rapid growth. But then how accurate we should be uh, knowing whether the patient is at the peak pubertal growth. A lot of uh, people uh, at that time proposed that growth modification, GM, or growth modification, so to be more effective if done before their peak pubertal growth. But Chetty also in 2005 suggested the use of protection headgear in combination with the rapid micro expander during the infantile and juvenile stages, because at the later stages, it will increase osseous structures of the heavily interdigitated suture. That was uh, research coming from Melton, Professor Melton, where they found that in the adolescent stage, the structures of the mid peloton structures would be heavily indicated, and it would be hard to, to, to perform a growth uh, modification. So to modify the maxilla, it was proposed to, to treat early, after, earlier before the growth spread. Suda, in, the, in their paper in 2000, a look at uh, 60 Japanese patients and they examine the effect of protection headgear on older and younger samples. And they want to see the difference as well between uh, the outcome between male and female. The result was the earlier stage of the skeletal maturation produced more forward movement of the maxilla and produced greater increase in maxilla length compared with later, later stage. Although, again, there are some variation happens in the results. And then Shah in 2003, also looking at the changes of bacteria protection by looking at patients divided into different SMI stages. And they found uh, those treated with the SMI 1 and 3 and SMI 4 and 7, there no different maxillary skills that advancement was found. And those who were treated at a later stage found significantly less skills advancement and more due to other compensation. Study by Franchi, the Italian group, compared class three cases with uh, an RME and protection headgear. Uh, they treated uh, before the pick or CBM1 and during the pick or CBM3, and then compared with untreated Japanese metrics by ethnicity, gender, and mean age. Those treated before the peak, somehow the maxilla grew by an additional 1.8 millimeter compared with control. That in contrast with those treated during the pick, and the maxilla grew only an addition of 0.7 millimeter. The, in contrast, the mandible growth, uh, growth restriction by about 3.5 millimeters for those who are treated before the peak, and uh, 4.5 millimeter to controls for those treated during the peak. Again, still there's a lot of variations. And again, it seems like the earlier we intervene, it looks it better. But again, there is a convincing RCT conducted in the UK. And you know, in the UK, they love to do this RCT. 
And right now, it's considered to be on the highest of the hierarchy of the, of the research. It's by the group uh, treated by Dr. Nikki Mandel. They do the patients 15, years, uh, 15 months follow-up, three years follow-up, and then six years follow-up after that. Basically, uh, they, they found that um, the object improved by increasing plus 4.4 millimeters for those with face masks, compared to just plus three millimeters of those uh, from in control. The SNA protracted 1.4 degrees for those with face masks, more than 0.3 for those uh, who are from the control group. But however, three years follow-up, the results maintain, but again, not much different with the control. There's again, questioning the long-term benefits. I'm not saying yet that it's not uh, worth doing, but it's just the long-term benefit, not much different. And then there's this interesting case report in the AJO. Uh, this was done in 2012. It was done by a uh, famous uh, Dr. Junji Sugawara and also uh, our dear friend as well, Professor Ravindra Nanda uh, in Connecticut. They looked at um, monozygotic twin sisters of a nine-year-old complaining of the anterior uh, negative overjet with problem lists like prognatic profile, uh, mild mandibular symmetry, class with the base, deviation of the mandibular midline, class with short face types. Now, these are twins. So the left one for the treated individual, the right one would be on the observational, treated only with one face treatment approach. The top last pic uh, picture was the uh, condition of the pre-treatment as phallometric values. The lower right shows the timing of the comparison. So the patient one is uh, the treated with two face. Patient was treated with face mask. And then the growth observation, and then started with second phase with fixed appliances, and then retention. And the patient two were only observed, done with only growth observation. And then at the similar stage, the, the patient number two were treated with orthodontic faces, also using a skeletal anchorage and then followed with retention. Now, at nine years old, to the, to the stage of eight, uh, 10 years old, we can see that the malocclusion is better for patient one after the first phase. The patient two still having that negative overjet. And of course, we can see that the phase one seemed to work well, because if you look at the Cephalometric superimposition, patient one seems to be better compared to patient two. And then at 16 years old, just for patient one before they move into the second phase, it shows more maxillary growth than did the patient two until they turn 14 years old. It was written in the journal that nevertheless, their skeletal difference gradually diminished during the pubertal growth period to the point that there was almost no difference in their skeletal profile at age 16. And we can see these were at 16 years old. So the patient one finished, uh, this is the, before the second phase, and then Patient two is before also. So, so patient one treated with pre-adjusted HYs, applied with class three elastics, and only requiring 12 months of treatment time. Now patient two, it requires to uh, modify the treatment by using a resin cap to just occlude the uh, occlusion, and then start with using uh, and treating the upper arch first, and then also using a uh, mini plate slitter anchorage system a total treatment, but treatment time of 18 months. So a bit longer than the patient one. So if you can see that between the patient one and patient two, both achieve similar results. But then again, the time for the second phase is shorter on the patient one during the second stage. 
But again, we have to also remember the effect on the psychosocial development of patient one compared to patient two. That actually were not actually investigated in this uh, uh, journal. So for class three cases, early treatment, the pros, well, early class three orthopedic treatment in patients under 10 years old is clearly and deadly effective in short term. And also phase one treatment had no impact on jaw growth. It made the phase two treatment simpler and easier. The early class three protection phase one treatment reduced the need for orthopedic surgery. Now the cons, there is a lack of evidence for the long-term benefit. And early protection phase one treatment does not seem to convert a clinically significant psychosocial benefit. Now, what about the manual for class two, especially? Bishara, at one point says that 60 to 70% orthodontic or data alveolar results and 30 to 40% would be uh, orthopedic or skeletal results. But majority of the clinical studies it shows that some landmarks show that functional plants allows the mandible to express its fully growth potential and perhaps increased mandibular length in a limited fashion. Yet whether the increase of that measurements are clinically relevant or not, then it is up to the clinician to decide. There are evidences that are pro of this statement. There's a lot of research done by Panchez and Huck in the 80s where they uh, proposed uh, modifying the growth of the mandible by using herbs appliances during the peak of standing height. Then Bacchetti also found a similar thing using twin block and concluded that yes, twin block could be initiated during or just slightly after peak, which is around the adolescent time, not too early as well. Faulted using Bionetter and found the same thing too. And then in 2018, there was a paper, which is coming also from the same group with uh, Josh McTamara and then also Frankie as well. Uh, Pavoni et al. uses a 46 class two patients treated with bionator and activator and then followed with full fixed appliances compared to a control group. And they were all divided between prepubital and pubital group according to their CVF. They said, that if the treatment were initiated before puberty, the class two correction would be mainly dental alveolar. Whereas when the treatment were initiated during the onset of puberty, the correction produced significant long-term student changes. But again, there's a problem with this research that it mainly uses a prospective data set. So it may be uh, slightly biased and have to be carefully interpreted when we are looking at the results. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the Evidences that are against. We, we have uh, outstanding two RCTs, a randomized control trial coming from Tala, Professor Kabila Tala, and also Professor Kevin O'Brien, where they questioned the clinical relevance of the, of the treated cases, and they considered that the changes were of small magnitude. And they suggested when they follow up the cases in their study, that the early treatment might not give additional benefit to the patient. Hence, the treatment can be postponed during adolescence rather than prior to the peak. Although actually, this is in agreement with the previous findings that uh, they advocate treatment for class twos during the peak or at least during the adolescence. We don't want to treat it too early as well. And that shows the O'Brien study where they also see uh, say that uh, the result may not be clinically relevant. But again, um, they say that the only thing that is, uh, can be accepted uh, significant is that the early treatment can be boosting psychosocial confidence and also preventing trauma. COSA in 2006 uh, did a systematic review. But again, he tried to criticize the RCP for not including uh, adequate skeletal maturation although the Tala and O'Brien paper did perform symptom attrition, although started treatment before the victim of growth. It's quite confusing when we are reading all this paper and all this paper were in contrast to each other. And, and, and sometimes we get confused that what should we do, I'm stuck. Well, um, 2014 in the UK also, and it's now published by the Cochrane Review, uh, with a group by Chiru Vin Kachari, which is the group with uh, Professor Kevin O'Brien, and it produced uh, a systematic review 
And they said, and they concluded that early treatment in young children, seven to 10 years old, followed with second phase in early adolescents, which is 11 to 16 years old, appeared to only significantly reduce incidence of incisive trauma as compared to one stage treatment in the early adolescents. And then it appeared also that there were no other advantage for providing a two phase treatment as compared to just a one phase treatment in early adolescents. And then functional plans provided statistically significant skeletal changes. However, it may not be clinically significant. And then they also concluded that there were no significant differences between the twin block group compared to any other types of functional appliance, except for the change of the AMD. And we will just uh, follow our paper in the AJO. And it also states there's no other advantage of providing two phase treatment compared to one phase in early adolescence. So, for class two, early treatment pros and cons. Well, the treatment results in substantial reduction in overjet and favorable, although small, change in circle pattern. Early treatment seems to be giving meaningful improvement in self-esteem, so boosting psychosocial development. And obviously, it decreases the risk of incisor trauma in children, especially with those with prominent upper front teeth. The cons. Well, early treatment with functional plants doesn't seem to change the class of skeletal pattern to a clinically significant degree. It increased the burden of the treatment timing for the patient, attendance, costs, and as well, early orthodontic treatment does not result in any meaningful long-term differences when compared with one course of treatment started in the late, next, or early permanent dentition. So perhaps I took this picture liberally from the book uh, from Professor Prophet, whereby it shows that when we expose the patient with a functional plant treatment, there seems to be an accelerated growth. But we expect that when we expose the patient with a functional plant treatment, that the growth will follow at the same pace and rate with the dotted line. And it says in the picture, the growth curve for the true stimulation. But it appears that over time, the end of the result would finally be not much difference with those that expected growth without the functional science treatment. So I guess uh, the picture of profit may be true after all, after looking at all this uh, research. Then I would just to, would like to end the talk by showing you some cases that I've been treating. Uh, personally, I do like using a growth modification, and that's probably because of my training in the UK. I use a lot of twin blocks, and it just helped me in many of the cases. It helped me on the second phase. It helps me to screen my patients as well, to screen their uh, cooperations as well. But again, I always uh, tell patients that we're not trying to create extra growth. We're trying to allow the growth to express its growth uh, potential. This patient provide, uh, presenting with a class two division one with increased overjet and with a lower lip biting habit, which in, uh, exaggerate the proclamation of the upper labial section. And the reason I like with the twin block appliance is that because it's a versatile appliance and I can always design it the way I want it to uh, meet up with the uh, condition of the patient. And I found the patient can adapt well with twin block because it's a two piece appliance. You can, uh, you can use it one by one first, not just like a big bulk uh, one appliance. Uh, you can see that the design was slightly modified. I put a lip bumper as well there to eliminate the position, to, to push away the position of the lower lip, just helping to stop the lower lip biting habit. If I put together, it may look like a Starship Enterprise from the Star Trek movie, but it works well. In just several months, it helps the, uh, the rapid correction of the overjet. And also the patient ceased from performing the lower lip biting habit. Then in case two, we have another class two division one with, a, uh, with an increase overjet. Again, I treated the patient just with a twin block. And again, 
we have a rapid change of the overjet and a correction of the profile. So as you look at the cephalometric, you can see the change of the proclination of the upper labial segments considerably. Again, no doubt that the profile changed dramatically and the patients have a boosted psychosocial development compared to before. What about then in class three? So this is a class three case and then still in a mixed dentition that we treat it with a uh, bonded RPE as well as combination with face mask. And I found it also, the result was good. The patient was happy, he changed the uh, incisive relationship dramatically before entering the stage two for using the fixed braces. And we can see the profile change dramatically from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And then I have another case that I would treat it by uh, my former uh, resident, and this was published in the Journal of the APOS. Another class three with a United Crossbite on the uh, left hand side, treated with a combination of um, bonded RPE and also face mask. This was just a few months after the treatment. Then once the gross modification done, and then followed up with uh, pre-adjusted uh, HOS appliance. And then finishing up like that into a class one occlusion, the soft in upper, class one buffer segment. But again, if you look at the uh, profile pictures, you can see how we have also changed the upper lip profile into a better one. Final case that I want to show you is another case that uh, I treated with my resident during her training. It's another class three again. This time we use a uh, RPE, banded RPE, again with face marks too, then followed up with the uh, aim and fix appliances. Achieving that this would nearly about 16 months and fishing up like that. And finishing up with a profile like that. This one, the profile doesn't really change dramatically like the previous one. So, points to remember from my talk today. Well, the first thing, timing of treatment seems to be very important so that orthodox treatment may be efficient and effective. We don't want to treat too, too early as well, unless for uh, important uh, process. And then case selection is very important. Treatment plan should be individualized to meet the patient's chief complaint. And treatment goals should be always clearly defined and explained to the patient, especially when we are going to uh, apply a two-phase treatment. Uh, the possibility of uh, the need of future treatment should always be discussed with the patient and the parent because it will require a longer commitment for both the patient and also the parent. And then the success of the growth modification therapy depends on the patient's age, the compliance, and the malnutrition. If the patient doesn't wish to comply, then forget about uh, using complicated treatment. And as well, of course, the orthodontist, uh, our preference, uh, and then whether we have access to lab uh, capability, skill, and of course, knowledge of using this complicated treatment. We try to always uh, perform evidence-based care. When we are treating our patients, we try to formulate the clinical question when we see the patients. We try to search the evidence, appraise the evidence, and apply the evidence to our practice. When the evidence is not available, then our vast clinical experience can come into play into the consideration. But again, this must be explained to the patient clearly. So I must agree with what Professor Kevin O'Brien uh, wrote in his blog. A combination of evidence-based orthodontics combination of clinical experience, clinical research, but again, also uh, taking into account uh, patient's opinion. 
And again, we have to remember that also dentist is a profession, it's not like in a like like a bargain in the market. So, because it's a profession, so evidence-based care is always the utmost importance. Last, I want to uh, reiterate this picture. Sometimes we have to explain to the patients, especially probably in the region. This may be relevant to the picture. There's a lot of patient that wants everything to be fast and cheap. But then again, you can see that the intersection says ugly, must be ugly. Then sometimes the patient wants everything must be cheap, but there has to be good. But then for this kind of cases, you have to wait because there will be a lot of people who want to act. To, uh, to access that kind of good or uh, service. Also, there are people who want things good and it has to be fun. But then again, it needs more money because the good ones, there's no free lunch from that. But the worst of all, they want everything to be cheap, but it has to be good and you have to provide it fast. Now, the answer to that, the cross, the crossing of those circles in the middle says, non-existence. So we have to explain to the patient what you actually demand as non-existent in the world of this. So thank you very much. I would like again to uh, thank for all the audience who have been listening to my sharing. I hope it has popped up uh, uh, the eyes for our experience and knowledge as well. Uh, and again, I would like to thank Professor Ibrahim for giving me the opportunity for sharing uh, my experience tonight. Thank you very much, Prof. Terima kasih, everyone. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Benny, for sharing your uh, experience with our audience tonight. And tonight we got about uh, 110 who joined us and another eight on the YouTube channel. Uh, check the YouTube channel. So uh, quite, uh, quite a good figure that we have. Also, uh, we are joined by our uh, registrar of the ICD, uh, Dr. John Ling from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, oh, hello, Dr. John Ling. Hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> to ask something to our speaker, Dr. John? Okay. This one, I have to say, this is my Sifu. Professor John Ling is my Sifu. <laughs> my Sifu in the UK. <laughs> Very nice stuff. Okay. Some of our students are listening to you. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a number of students listening to uh, Dr. Benny tonight. Uh, well, on the chat, uh, I don't see any um, any uh, questions. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Dr. Benny, if you, you want to know your colleagues uh, with UITM, Dr. Inda, also joined. Uh, Dr. Inda Yuri. Yeah, Inda Yuri also. Apakala, Dr. Inda Yuri. So I promoted her to ask questions, but uh, he, she did not respond, but she just... <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great lecture. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Benny. Uh, You're uh, welcome, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, uh, there's one question in uh, oh, he just, uh, from Q&A. Uh, he, the question asked is, uh, have you ever experienced failure in treating early orthodontic patients? Can you tell us your key learning points view from that failure? Uh, no, no name given, it's just anonymous. Uh, so uh, I guess you're remain anonymous, Dr. Benny. Of course. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahim, for the question. And thank you very much for whoever asked uh, and raised the question. Of course, uh, by time, we will always encounter failure. And I also find fa failure uh, throughout my experience. Uh, and it mainly uh, occur with not identifying the right patient, especially when this deals with motivation. I had a patient whom I uh, was treating with a combination of uh, RME and also a face mask for class three. It's mainly the mother insisted on treating the patient because they have a history of class three. So I said, okay, uh, let's treat it with the, with the face mask. The, the parents seems to be okay. And at the start, the, the patient seems to be okay too. I explained, I explained to the mother how to turn the screws and everything. Everything seemed to be okay. And then I recall the patient. And then the patient did not respond until about, uh, I think about four or five months. 
And then the bonded RP already come off. And throughout this period of absence without leave or a wall, the patient said that I have never worn the appliance. I don't like it. So I said, why did you actually accept the treatment? Oh, because my mother forced me to. <laughs> Initially, I didn't want to. So doing growth modification relies heavily on the patient's cooperation. That's why in America, they use everything must be bonded, like herbs appliance and everything. Uh, I don't think twin block or anything removable uh, growth modification appliance can be applied to patients who have less motivation. But again, this failure did not stop me from uh, doing this treatment as well. So once you have the right sense of identifying the right patients, the growth modification treatment produced very good results and very satisfied with that result uh, in many of the cases. But again, I have to admit that yes, I do have uh, certain cases who, are, who have been a failure. I mean, so I think uh, that's uh, my experience. Also, uh, another thing is uh, design. Design. With the twin block design. At that time, I have a class to division one with a lower lip cut, not the one that I presented. But uh, I didn't consider of using that uh, modification of uh, lip bumper at that time. So the result was not very good. The patient kept biting the lower lip. So uh, once I identified the patient have a lower lip biting habit, I always modify my twin block with a soldered uh, lip bumper in the lower part of the twin block. So I guess probably that's my sharing from Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you. Of my failure, yeah. yeah. We have another question of Benny. Um, I, I don't know how to pronounce the name right or not. Uh, uh, M-U-Y, I don't know how to spell it, but uh, the, the second part, second name is Vatanak. Uh, Asa, what is the suitable age for using face masks in early orthodontic treatment? Well, if you look at the evidence that we have shown, for me, I prefer to start early. So I started normally my face mask patient at around 10 years old. I don't want to start too early but I don't want to start too late as well. So 10 years old is about the right age. And then again, most importantly, not just the age, but whether the patient is willing to get, and get involved with the commitment of wearing the appliance. Even if we treat the patients at the right time, but if the patient have a very low compliance, it will not work out. But again, age-wise, I always want to try my face mask patients at around 10 years old uh, before they get too old. I think that's my answer to that. Okay, I think it's very clear. Yeah, you have answered. Uh, I hope the, uh, yeah, he said thank you. <laughs> I will, uh, thank you as well. All right, I think, um, I, I think that's about the, oh, there's another question that just came in. How long does the twin block treatment take in case one and two? You mentioned just now. Case one and two. Let me just remind myself again with my case one and two. Ah, I see. Okay. So the case one and two, it reaches the result like that, like what I have shown in the presentation, in around six to eight months. Mm -hmm. So when the patient uh, have a very good compliance, you should expect some good results coming out in less than nine months normally. But again, it could be protracted longer if the patient doesn't have good compliance. I, have, I normally uh, tell my patient, the more you wear, the faster you will get the result. The more you keep always making excuses, you will be seeing me in a longer period. That's what I always say. Okay, yeah, I hope uh, that answers the question eh? because it's from anonymous, it doesn't say any name. So I guess I think that's uh, about four questions that we have from our audience tonight. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benny Sobiato. No problem. It's a pleasure and my honor. Probably Dr. John didn't want to add up something. <laughs> <laughs> As my teacher. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <clears throat> what's your rationale if you find 
cases who have syndromes, such as uh, flat palate or Pierre Robin syndrome or this sort of um, skeletal uh, anomalies. Yeah, I have to say I don't have uh, much experience yet, especially after you I work come in the back hospital. You should have. Yeah. <laughs> I work in the hospital, but uh, we don't have much exposure to uh, the syndromes like that. I think mainly because uh, it uh, mainly concerns with the funding as well. We haven't got that kind of uh, integrated treatment yet in our country. So uh, for us, we don't see much of that uh, during our uh, clinical training as well, especially also to my residents. So I may not be able to comment precisely for that issue. Sorry about that, Lucy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think. Uh, uh, I think before we finish, I think we'll, uh, ICD. I take this opportunity to congratulate um, Dr. John Ling, uh, who has received an award uh, recently for Hong Kong. Uh, uh, Congratulations, Dr. John Ling. So we are very proud of you, Dr. John, uh, for receiving the award from Fellowship of Hong Kong. Eh? Hong Kong. Okay, all right. Uh, again, uh, on behalf of Section 15, I uh, would like to thank you, Dr. Benny, uh, for sharing, and we hope okay. that we can uh, meet again in, in, in future. Uh, is it that? Uh, okay, as usual, um, uh, I will introduce uh, what we have for our uh, in two weeks' time. Okay, and uh, two weeks' time, we will have um, our our Press, uh, Vice President, uh, who will share with us. Uh, wait, uh, uh, the, uh, share with us the um, uh, topic on uh, inferior alveolar neurectomy as a management option in the uh, trigeminal neuralgia uh, as an uh, option eh, uh, from Professor Ashad Malik uh, from Pakistan. Of course, he is the a vice president of section 15. All right, so thank you very much all for joining us tonight and thank you, Dr. Benny, again. Thank and you very much, Professor Ibrahim. Looking forward to see you in Bali. Yeah, thank you. We go to I have not gone to Jakarta for a long time. Yes, uh, looking forward to see you in person. Maybe when times get better, uh, we'll yes, be certainly stay safe. Uh, we'll stay safe, everyone. Yeah, stay safe and thank you, Dr. John, for link, uh, joining us tonight. And also, uh, we have uh, Region of Singapore, Dr. T.C. Pua, also have joined in our. Uh, hello, Dr. Pua. Yeah. Okay, so that's all uh, for tonight. And thank you for uh, joining us. And I hope to see you all again in uh, two weeks' time to meet our Vice President uh, with his topic on inferior alveolar directomy as an option management of trivalent gemalgia. Hey, thank you all. Uh, see you again. Thank you very much. Okay, terima kasih. Selamat malam. Selamat malam, and thank you to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Amy and Datin Mayuna, for helping me with that. Thank you for everyone. Yes, thank you very much. And, and goodbye. And goodbye. Have